Welcome to the Zero to Five Million Dollar Podcast. I'm Sean Finder, and I'm with my host Ollie Whitfield. This show is brought to you by Autoclose, a vanilla soft company. Ollie, are you introducing today's guest, or are you just going to tell everyone what the topic we're talking about today is? Today's guest is you. So you haven't been prepared, and I'm going to enjoy this. Um, pretty much what we're going to do, a bit of a fun exercise. I'm going to give you a $20 million funding round, and you're going to spend it. And you can okay. say whatever you want. The only ground was just for the sake of ease. So maybe we should quickly do a little introduction to what we have at Autoclose at this point in time, because I think just to make it simple, we'll have to use a benchmark. So you're going to use the money for Autoclose. So why, why don't you do a quick, here's the lay of the land for the team, like team size and, and departments. And then, uh, then you can have that time to think. And uh, I think maybe I'm going to play the role of the venture capitalist who's going to get, you know, all over your ass and like pester you and why haven't you spent this money and where's my ROI and uh, I'm going to have some fun giving that sort of grief to you but but tell us about the departments and the lay of the land first. Perfect so Autoglose um, if you don't know is a, is a sales engagement platform um, top of the funnel that help you drive leads down the funnel so we have a full um, email platform with a lot of fun stuff like video um, soon to be a LinkedIn integration um, we have a database that's full of B2B contacts with over 37 million B2B contacts in there. So you can actually add contacts into your campaign. The way the structure of our company right now is um, on the more sales side, we have uh, SDRs. SDRs role are to generate those leads, get those demos, and give those demos then to our AEs. Our AEs are the ones that are doing the demos, trying to close that business. Um, we have a CSM team, customer success. Um, so once that that person ends up closing, that deal goes to the CSM team who does an introduction, goes on a call with all of our prospects. They engage with them, see what integrations they find out, any problems. They basically set that whole link in that white glove for first time using the platform. We have a full development team, project manager on the development team. Um, and then we have uh, a few people in the exec team that's more operational. So they're looking big picture stuff, um, but that's kind of how the uh, the team, and we have support. We have, do have live support. We have live support inside the app um, from eight to six Eastern standard time. Um, but we also do have people that do reply if it's later than that. So that's kind of lay the land on how the uh, the structure currently is uh, for the auto close product line. You going to offend me any more with that or not? What team do I work in? Hello? Well, we have a demand, we have a, we have a demand gen team and a Thank marketing you. team. We, we do um, have that. But, uh, you know, and, and we have a content writer um, and we have uh SEO team. But uh, just because I'm always on that call, I want to kind of give them a little yeah. bit of... Uh, and in fairness uh, to you, the teams are uh, joined together from the acquisition. So in a sense, it's not the order close marketing team. It's like one for both. It's a so. product line. So there's multiple product lines and the marketing team does two separate product lines. The sales team though focuses strategically on one product line, but then we'll cross ref cross sell if the opportunity uh, um, presents itself. Right. So 20 million comes across the desk. First okay. port of call. And uh, if you, if you don't want to go too deep into the numbers, uh, that would be cool. If we're, if we're able to do that, we'll keep a tally of what you spend and where, but where would you start to invest first? What's the very first thing? So the first thing is I would do, um, I would definitely enhance the sales team. Um, I would probably get um, seasoned vets as account executives. Um, so what we've done internally, um, we were a bootstrap company before the acquisition. And what we did was we promoted, we promoted everyone internally. So we had support that moved into, you know, SDRs, SDRs that might have turned to the AEs. So I would kind of enhance the sales team um, first. So that means hire some more SDRs hire some more AEs, but at the same time, you need to um, to really focus on getting those leads in. So the SDRs doing outbound is, is not going to be the only thing. We are going to probably put 30% into marketing. So I would say we're going to put five, six million into marketing, expand the marketing team, um, also do a lot of um, you know PPC and, and anything to really generate more demos. Because if we get more sales teams, we need to try and fill their calendar with demos. But more importantly, I think we're going to put into development. Um, I would build some AI technology stuff. So I'd probably say 30 to 40. I'd probably spend 40% into the development. And the reason why is if I'm given 20 million, I want to make sure that I've developed certain features 
AI features that might be, for example, with our content, um, you know, almost an AI that will kind of correct people's email campaigns, make sure they're writing good emails, better converting emails. Um, and I would do that because AI is something that costs a lot of money. It takes a lot of time. So if you have a bootstrap company that's trying to compete with you, um, that doesn't have that $20 million, that $10 million you're putting into that AI or $5 million you're putting in the AI, you have a competitive advantage. So that's the one thing that people can do is you can build features, build improvements, do everything a lot quicker than your competitor when you have that money. But I think um, the AI is is a long game. It takes you know AI to gather that research, gather that data for the AI. So I would probably do something on that end so that I know that um, it's not something that can be replicated very easy. So if I had to do it, I would say, uh, let's just put numbers. Let's do 6 million into marketing, headcount, product, more leads, 6 million into sales, SDRs, seasoned vet AEs, build out that sales team um, and get an, out an outbound, more of an outbound approach from my SDRs. And the other would be on the development, continue to make sure that we're ahead of our competition with building features in AI. Okay, that was a very quick 20 mil. Maybe I should have made it 50, but we, we probably would have been here an hour. Lots of things come to mind. Um, I will go through a couple of the nuances there. I didn't hear you say any senior hires or anything like that. Normally when a big round comes in, you see, you know, if you've got a VP, you see an SVP. If you've got a director, you see a senior director. You get all of those variations and people to come in, yep. middle management, upper management. You didn't say any of that. Don't think the team's missing anything? Think there's better ways to spend it? Or does that come within parts of the investment? Well, that becomes in part of the investment. So when I say sales team, that's including hire more AEs, SDRs, team leads. You know, when you have 20 million, you're going to need a CFO, CEO. Well, you have a CEO, but, you know, CSOs, CTO. You're going to have all those C-levels. So even with marketing, you know, currently we don't really have a CMO for this product line. We have someone that manages, you know, the entire marketing team, but I would probably do product line specific because with those with those investments, it's tough to just take one team and split them into two. You can do that when you're bootstrapped, you haven't raised money. But when you actually raise money, that's when you have to say, okay, we need to be very specific because the way you're going to market for auto close product line is different than you might market for the vanilla soft product line. So you d definitely senior hires is in there, but I kind of put that all in as part of that, um, as that bundle. Okay. So, uh, Bit of a theoretical question, which leads into to one I wanted to ask you. You raise money. Um, obviously, that's in the bank. Is there any reason you cannot acquire a company using some of that money? Is that is that ever in any terms and conditions, or is that perfectly fine? Oh, that's that's a lot of the time. That's the reason why people give money, right? They want you to acquire. So sometimes it's better to acquire a company. So you know, for example, that might be something where you might want to acquire a marketing a company that's doing some marketing that generates a lot of leads in this space, you know, the same reason why, why do you think an outreach, for example, might've acquired a sales hacker? They acquired I was thinking it. more of your email. Um, you, you said the email tool you wanted to build. I mean, build it takes however long, could be six months. Like you've got new, new developers. They got to learn the ropes. They got to start doing it. It's not going to be a couple of weeks, especially if it's AI, it can be like quite complicated. So to buy a company that's already got a customer base, obviously, if you're down the VC route and you've got that term sheet and you've got MRR, ARR and various incomes, that's, you know, that that's another yep. string to the bow, but, but I didn't hear you say it. So maybe, maybe that was out of the detail, but it, it obviously depends on who's in the market, what's available and, and the negotiation, but. Well, the reason why I didn't say is because there's not a company that does it really well right now. So there's not a company that right now does a lot of AI on email content on what that content should look like, um, how it should look, why, you know, because one of the biggest, you know, reasons why people leave sales engagement, they give up on emails because their content is just terrible. They don't, they have five calls to action instead of one. They have a subject line that's 10 words. They have an email that is so salesy. I'm talking about something that comes in and will actually almost write that email copy for you that knows that, listen, we've analyzed 500,000 emails this is the structure. This is the words. These are the ping words. These are the words that will get that prospect to take the next step. Um, and there's no one company that does it properly. So I think if you could do it really properly and build a platform that actually can convert those emails for your prospects, 
I think a sales engagement tool will be a lot more successful than their competitors because right now it's just not done well enough. Okay. I know of a few that do something like that. Um, not necessarily shots fired. They don't do it to the degree that you're talking about. And if they did, they'd probably be worth a couple billion. So it, that's it. So you, yeah. if you're getting raised that money, you know, you're not getting that 20 million. So your company grows by 10%. They're giving you 20 million because they want you to get, build a unicorn. And how do you build a unicorn is you have to have some sort of competitive advantage over your competition. So having some sort of AI, some sort of technology, some sort of machine learning that is differentiating yourself from your competition is the way that will get you that extra valuation down the road. So development, I always agree. Um, that's pretty much what everybody always does with any money if they're software at all. Loads of developers, we want to ship more, we want to build new features. That's a, a wonderful thing. No one ever argues with that. The salesperson thing, um, again, really common. And uh, sadly, with venture capital money, any sort of economic downturns mean a lot of salespeople get canned. That, yep. That's a terrible thing in this world, but it's part of it. I always think um, when someone says that first, like you did, I thought, how are they being fed here? Because at the moment, we're kind of inbound. Like we do split pretty well. But like you said, definitely would need to be more outbound. So how much of that would you be thinking, let's get a bunch of um, good salespeople in straight away, but they've got to be outbound experience heavy because otherwise they're going to they're gonna have to wait a while before you've, you've given the marketing money. You know, like we always talk about, you need 100 leads. Okay, cool. I can do it in a month because I've got to do a webinar for that. And I can't do that right now. But a salesperson, they can prospect right now and they might get a demo for tomorrow. So it's it's different and it would take time, wouldn't it? Yeah, so you need more SDRs. So I would probably have two to three SDRs per account executive so that that account executive has five to seven demos per day. Um, SDRs will be doing all outbound. So we are more of an inbound kind of social um, company right now. But getting on the calls, getting on those phones, having enough people making those dials um, would definitely... Uh, would definitely be important. But the reason why I always tell people you need sales and the reason why I mentioned sales, and I've had this conversation with many people is some people disagree with me is you can develop the best product in the world. You can develop, I can develop the iPhone, but if you don't have a, if you have a, if you don't have a sales team selling the iPhone, the iPhone is not worth much. So you can, if you can, I can build the best software, which is why you see a lot of companies that developers build and they, they put them up for sale because they can develop. But if you, can, if you can't sell it and get it out there, what's the point of development? I can spend $20 million on development, but I have nobody selling the product. I'm not making that $20 million back that I just spent on development. So that's why I think sales is very important. But you have to do it properly. You have to have both channels, outbound and inbound, coming in. You have to have marketing bringing in supporting sales on the inbound. You have to have the SDRs doing the outbound. You have to have the AEs having full calendars. An AE that just has one to two demos a day and you're hiring 10 AEs is just a waste of money. You need to make sure that you have you have those 100 demos, okay, with well, the 99 AEs that are all at the time, every single day, focusing on those 100 demos. So when you're doing that, um, as a company like AutoClose, I, I mean, obviously, their pricing is on the website, so this is no secret. It, it can be under 100 bucks a seat, and we sometimes get uh, deals where it's 10 seats or above, which is wonderful. Not everybody's like that. So it's what we would call probably small ticket sales. It's, it's definitely not mid-market or enterprise by any stretch. When you're hiring a bunch of, particularly as you said, seasoned salespeople, are you thinking about um, going mid-market? Are you thinking of certain industries? So, for example, on the vanilla soft side, we have a very strong segment in the higher education market, which is wildly different to everywhere else that we sell. So we have specific language, we have specific team and content and all these things. So in the same way, would you be making a play at a certain market with that in mind where the deal size is bigger? Otherwise... I mean, you're going to be stupidly busy selling a hundred dollar a seat if you're only getting one seat at a go. I mean, does it, if you have nine demos a day and you convert all of them, it's still only nine hundred. Yep. So there's two things. One is mid market, yes, um, bigger leads uh, agencies. But if you are going to sell the hundred dollar seats, you got to be selling them in annual contracts. So meaning, you know, a goal might be you have to sell one a day, right? One a day. You have you have seven demos. You have to sell one a day at twelve hundred dollars. So now twelve hundred dollars. If I'm paying that person two hundred and fifty bucks a day, three hundred bucks a day, he's making he's selling at twelve hundred every single day. So I would say you're doing a hundred dollars annual deals, but you're also looking mid market. Now I don't go enterprise simply because you know I let the sales loft the big fish, the sales loft the outreach, so them go after the enterprise. We stay in that mid market, but there's a lot of money to be made in the mid market. Um, even if you go almost SM, you know, small to medium, a lot of money to be made. So 
Um, definitely right, because the one the one thing you'll have if you're selling hundred dollar seats at month to month is you'll have salespeople that you're paying that can't make commissions because who wants to make a commission on a hundred dollar deal? So you can't really pay a sales team. So you got to be very careful when you are doing that pricing structure for your company. Do you have to consider going more upmarket with the pricing and the features with that, or can you do it that way forever? No, you need to go up market, um, and you need to, you know, because a if you want to hit the numbers that you're going to get from those investors from your VC firm, which is you, Ollie, um, they're going to want to see a lot of growth, and they're going to see that hockey stick going real quickly upwards. So if you are, you know, keeping the pricing at hundred dollars, etc., and you're giving the same features, that's why I said you need to build features, make improvements that are kind of give those prospects the wow factor over your competition. So if I'm telling them you got to spend 50 bucks more on our product, but this is A, B, and C, Y, then they're more likely to do it. All right. How many months down the line before I'm knocking on your door? Where's my ROI? What's going on? How long do you think? Well, you always want to have at least, I, I say, 18 months of runway as well, especially in an economy like this. So I would say, you know, you are going to be at board meetings every quarter. Every single three months, you're going to have an update. Um, but you should definitely see your EBITDA um, try and be in that 40% range, but at least your growth being that at least 30, 40% range as well um, sometimes at the early going. So growth will be starting off very good, but I would say within 12 months, you're going to be knocking on my door saying, okay, have you hit your number? Okay. Not too bad. You didn't give me a proper number. Very smart of you. Well done. Um, what else is there? Who's going to be the hardest hire for you? So any job title within any of the departments you're talking about could be VP of development, VP of sales, director of marketing ops, or whatever it would be. Who's going to be the most difficult for you to hire? Right now, it would probably be a CFO. And the reason why I would say that is I would want my CFO and strat being involved in strategy on pricing. Because I think Pricing is something that people just come up, okay, I want to charge 50 bucks a month. But you know what? They haven't done an analysis to say, okay, should my price be 60, 50, 40? What number is going to give me with the leads coming? What number is going to give me that optimal number of revenue? So I would have somebody really do a pricing strategy with our company to make sure that our packages make sense. But they're also putting us into success for down for growth down the road. Okay. Probably last one, unless, uh, unless you give me something easy to question you on here. Three biggest challenges you as the founder, the CEO are going to find here with spending that money and putting all of it together. It's going to be a lot of new people, new stuff going on at once. What's going to go wrong? What's going to be a challenge? One would be culture to make sure everyone has the same culture and the same goals. Uh, two will be training because as you hire a lot of people, you need to have training process in place for each department. Um, so you have to have that in place before you build those hires. So everyone that comes in, it's not that they're spending. And C would be finding the right people. Um, finding the right people that uh, share the same goals, but also um, you know are motivated to work for a company that just raised money that's in full growth mode that is uh, is going to be probably doing a lot of running and not walking. I don't know if I agree with that last one. I, I think people there's a breed of person in SaaS who is like that's their picture perfect scenario, but maybe there's a question about the quality and quantity. It d it depends. If you're Snowflake, Salesforce, one of the big boys, then you put our job ad, boom, 2,000 applicants, you've got SaaS experience. If you're not, maybe not quite like that. So in, in a sense, how, maybe how are you going to deal with that? What if you don't get highbrow candidates? You're going to have to pay a recruiter to go after those experienced vets like you talked about, or are we going to go more like a farming route where we train people up? Well, I mean, in the economy right now, people are losing their jobs all the time, so there's tons of people on the market. But I would definitely use a recruiter. Um, for this, because this is a big project, you need a full HR team. You're going to be hiring a lot of people. You're going to be in full out, you know, hiring mode. Um, but you're going to want specific people. So I think if you can put your mission, your and have all that, um, all that set out, um, I think you'll get the right candidates, and uh, those are the ones that make you successful. All right, last one. Um, well, two actually. What raise am I getting? What raise? We've got twenty getting? mil. Yeah. You? Like 100, yeah, yeah, me, like 100, 200, 20. I mean, just because you do a raise doesn't mean people get a, just because you do a raise of VC doesn't mean you're going to give raises right away. Um, if you have hard work and you hit your goals and you hit your KPIs and no cares, yeah, you'll get a raise, Holly. That's a big if, if you know me. <laughs> All right, and last one. So, like, what exotic island are you retiring to? How many weeks off are you taking after that you, check you know comes what? over? I've fallen in love with Greece. 
Um, so I would probably go to Greece um, because I went there. I went there on my honeymoon and I uh, have not been back, but uh, it was a great time. So I'd love to go back. And uh, But this time just live on a nice big yacht, Ollie. After okay. Myself. A little bit of a Greek sales team coming up. There we go. That type of thing. Okay. Team I like building. It. Team building in Greece. Team building for you and, and your wife and your baby. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Well, Perfect. well, that was good. Well done. You spent the money. Um, I can't really fault any of the logic. Um, I, I would have gone about it a slightly different way, but it's very similar kind of ideology there. And, uh, and that was good. Maybe next time we'll do 50 or 100. I'd like to see you sweat over 100. I, I think that's that's a lot. And you maybe we'll have to have a rule where you can't say the exact same quantities per per number. But uh, sounds, that was good fun. Sounds like a plan. Well, thank you guys, everyone, for listening today. Uh, another episode of the Zero to Five Million Dollar Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to give us a five star review wherever you're listening from, um, and let us know if we can bring on any guests you guys would like or answer any questions you guys would like as well. Uh, once again, Ollie, thank you so much, and uh, we'll see you guys next week. <laughs>